Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the press conference this afternoon with Muhammad Ali, our speaker here on campus for Horizons 3. His speech will be tonight at 8 o'clock. Uh, for members of the press who are staying over tonight who need press passes, please see Craig DuPriest, who's located down here in the front row. And those who are staying over and who want to eat, also see Craig, please. I'll begin the questioning and we'll ask uh, uh, the sportscasters and everyone here in the news to ask their questions uh, as they come. Uh, and to begin the questioning, I'll ask Mr. Ali, uh, much talk has been going around concerning your age and your comeback, and how long do you think you'll be able to top uh, to fight top-notch fighters? That's a good question. My age, well, I'm 31 years old, and, uh, and in this sport, 31 is not really old, and it's not young, but it's right at the peak, and everything from there usually is downhill. But I rank myself with fighters like Sugar Ray Robinson, who was about 45 when he quit. I don't plan to go that long. Archie Moore was about 53. Jack Johnson, who was about 50-something. And they were really at the best at that age. And after Joe Lewis lost to Max Mellon, he came back and knocked him out and made him greater. And just Sugar Ray lost to Randy Turpin. He came back and knocked him out and made him greater. And uh, I lost to Ken Norton. And when I come back and knock him out, I'm going to be greater. <laughs> and... So the age really don't mean nothing. I plan to fight about another year and a half. It's my timetable. Whip Ken Norton and then whip George Fullman and then have a big fight with Joe Frazier, title defense, and then quit. That's what I plan. <coughs> so I'm young enough to last that long. Is that the order you want to fight them in? Right. Uh, you're renowned as a friend or acquaintance of Howard Cassell. Are you a friend or foe? Whatever comments you have about Howard. Well, I will co well, we don't get along too well. I made him in this country. He wouldn't be nothing if it wasn't for him following me around and giving him interviews. He's so popular now to have a Howard Cosell doll on the market. <laughs> the unique thing about this doll is you don't have to wind him up and he talks anyway. <laughs> yeah, I've been knowing Howard Cosell a long time, done a lot of interviews with him. I've made my mistakes, and he's made his mistakes. Funny thing about his mistakes are he never makes the same mistake twice because he makes new ones. <laughs> All the time he makes new ones. And I uh, wrote a poem about him, but I won't recite that poem now. I'll wait till later. Do you have any poetry or other comments on uh, George Foreman or Joe Frazier right now? Well, people ask me what's going to happen if I meet George Foreman. And I wrote a poem on how the fight will sound over radio, and it goes like this. Ali comes out to meet Foreman, but Foreman starts to retreat. If George goes back an inch farther, he'll wind up in a ringside seat. Ali swings to the left. Ali swings to the right. Look at the kid carry the fight. George keeps backing, but there's not enough room. It's a matter of time. There Ali lowers the boom. Now Ali lands to the right with a beautiful swing, and the punch lifts George clean out of the ring. <laughs> George... George is still rising, but the referee wears a frown, for he can't start counting till George comes down. <laughs> now George disappears from view. The crowd is getting frantic, but our radar stations have picked him up. He is somewhere else over the Atlantic. Who would have thought when they came to the fight that they witnessed the launching of a colored satellite? <laughs> still in orbit. Well, really, wasn't it Cosell that kind of stood up with you, though, when you were having your trouble several years ago? Well, see, he's tricky. <laughs> Sometimes he's with you, then he'll turn right around and ask me a question that'll get me in a whole lot of trouble if I don't answer it right. He's tricky. He's a lot of, he's kind of phony. You know, he wears a hard piece up here, you understand? And many people ask me, is how old Cosell's, uh, Hair is real. I say, yes, his hair is real, but the rest of it ain't. <laughs> the co sale is something. We just had a roast dinner for him last night in Las Vegas. Me, Don Rickles, Wilt, uh, what's his name, Bill Russell, and uh, a couple more people, football coaches, and Flappy White and Red Fox, and we all tore him up. <laughs> He'll be on TV in about another three or four weeks. When was your jaw broken in the Norton fight, and how was the jaw now? There's a little controversy on the 
was was I said the first round I thought, but it was the uh, second round. And uh, the jaw's getting better. It's not ready to be punched at. Need six more weeks to really knit. Then all my back teeth out, I found out have caused it because no support. I got to get the bridge made and teeth put in there. But the complication in that fight was fighting 10 rounds and not getting hit on that broken jaw again. And that was kind of rough, but I still managed to make it a draw up to the 11th round. And it was even, and he was told uh, by his trainers that he had to take the last round and just go all out. So he came out slugging, and it was kind of hard for me to stand there and trade punches toe to toe, knowing that if I'd got hit here, it'd have been terrible. And just to throw punches and then jump around hurt. You talk to somebody with a broken jaw and tell them, you know, just imagine, just 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 do that to it, with you. just do that to a broken jaw. And so uh, this is what happened to me in that fight. But next time it'll be much different. Musically speaking, if he don't see sharp, he'll be flat. <laughs> <laughs> Will you be more cautious in the ring now? No, not just more cautious, but uh, be serious. I don't. I didn't train like I should. I played, and I didn't run like I should. I didn't eat like I should. And I just took it for granted. This won't be no contest. And as you see, even under that condition, it was close. And if the jaw wasn't broke, I'd beat him. But this was just God talking to me. I'm a spiritual man, religious man. I believe God was punishing me for the way I've been living. I haven't been living right according to my religious beliefs, too. And I know. I don't have no... I'm glad it happened. Now I can be more serious and train and realize that I can be beat. I didn't believe I could be beat. You must, you must realize a funny feeling being the baddest human on earth. <laughs> and you can get intoxicated with greatness. Some people see a man is intoxicated will do something that he wouldn't do sober, ordinarily. And I was intoxicated with greatness, knowing that I could be, even under the Joe Frazier fight, he went to the hospital for a month, and he took the worst brutal treatment. And it now proves that he's finished. He took a terrible beating. I just lost the decision because of the draft and all that controversy. But at that moment, I've never been beat. And even in the Ken Norton fight, I didn't take no whipping. So... Uh, I just have to get like I did when I was hungry. See, it's a hard thing when a fighter or a ball player or anybody reach a certain point to where they have a million or so dollars in reserve and they know they don't have to get up and work hard and a little age is getting to them. And that's my problem now, making myself work. Because if I make myself work, it's impossible for me to lose to a human in the next three years. Impossible. If I'm in shape and my weight's right, you believe that, don't you? Oh, yeah. Not as dumb. <laughs> You're not as dumb as you look. <laughs> you mentioned fighting for uh, Norton, Foreman, and Frazier again. You said you had about two more years of boxing. And it might be. Uh, I like to get it over in a year and a half. If the quickest they are ready. See. Well, you be see, ready. This yeah, I'd be ready. See, Frazier had the title for two and a half years. He fought two nobodies. I fought ten top fighters. George Foreman and B. Joe Frazier, and you haven't heard nothing since, have you? Haven't heard nothing about a return fight with Frazier? Now have you heard about a defense? It's all, the game is dead. These fellas can't write no poems. They have no charisma, no personality. They can't do no shuffles. They can't predict no rounds. And they can't talk, and they're ugly. <laughs> so, this is why the game, they need me back. For a couple more years, I'll keep it going. I'll come back with my shuffle and my dances and my poetry, and I'm, you know, kind of pretty for a fighter. And I'll straighten this thing out. What do you think would have happened in boxing if you had lost the first list uh, first list? Boxing would have been going on. Boxing will always be. Boxing is a sport that will be here when all of them are finished. What do it take to play a ball game? Twelve men or nine men. You have to have equipment. You have to have a place. You have to have uh, bats. You have to have gloves. You have to have diamonds. What to take for a boxing match? Just me and you arguing. I don't care if it's in the alley or hallway in the school. There's always going to be fights. You know, even on the ball field they fight. Even in ice hockey they, they end up boxing. Boxing is the most natural sport. It only take two people who are angry at each other about something. Uh, you can get a fight on. So it ain't hard. I mean, boxing never dies. I mean, it's so silly. It's in boxing. People say, you think boxing is going to die? How is boxing going to never die? As much as people are going to fight. Women box. Everybody <laughs> fight. <laughs> Do you ever see girls sometime on campus do a little boxing sometime? You ever have fights on campus sometime? Yeah. You like them, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How is boxing going to die? Huh? Could you demonstrate the alley shuffle? 
Ain't you something? He wants me to differentiate the shuffle. He's sitting in a $500 seat, and he won't see the shuffle for nothing. <laughs> to get this close to me to see the shuffle is at least $100. You want me to shuffle? Uh, why you want to get by so cheap? You're not Jewish, are you? <laughs> you don't look Jewish. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm not in no shape to do shuffle now. You have to really hate a man when you go into. No. When you do that, then you lose. You know, you hate calls frustration. You can't think. Never. Norton, I don't hate Norton. I'm not mad because I'm wrong. I didn't play right, have my mouth open. I was talking when I got hit. I remember. I'm always talking to opponents. You know, like, sucker, you don't stand a chance. How are you going to whoop me tonight? Look, I'm too pretty. Don't get away. Don't hit me, you naughty boy. You move. What are you trying to I said move it. I don't want it. Now take it away. You take his punches. Now I got hit. Sam, see, mouth open, see, and his jaw is like, if you just close your mouth, it won't get the jaw broke. Didn't you like remember when you were hit? Yeah, not exact words, about the sack of round. That was an uppercut, and I was like, saying something in the clinch, and it was a, <laughs> funny feeling, man, <laughs> to have your mouth You're closed six weeks, again. huh? You're almost beautiful again. Almost. <laughs> no. You, you could break my jaw if you hit me at the right time and I'm not expecting it. It's easy to break a jaw. How many you are you bid towards this country or the uh, boxing association for depriving you of the chance of being all times the greatest champ in history? They deprived me of the chance. Oh, in other words, you're saying I'm not the greatest champ in history. Well, I think you are, but that's a debatable issue. The official one on the paper. Well, uh, let's have a little talk about it first. This is, uh, let's, this is fun. Let's, I'm gonna, let's have a little light debate, friendly debate. Now, the greatest champ in history, heavyweight champ, you all name, you name who you think was the greatest heavyweight champ. This is, I'm going to show you something. Marciano. Rocky Marciano. Okay, greatest heavyweight champ. Now, this this. This is a game called hit and not be his boxer. A great fighter is one who can execute, do, get in, and he don't get hit. Marciano took more punches. He was, his face, nose was cut off at one point as a child, like Joe Frazier. He took too many punches to be ranked. He wasn't a boxer. He's a rough, sharp, muscular. He wasn't no way ranked as a great boxer. You wouldn't take no boxing school and say, now we can watch Marciano's films and learn the technique of boxing. No. Like Joe Lewis. The greatest? Joe Lewis would be one who might be ranked with me. <laughs> Why will I say? Joe Lewis was a, a shuffler. In the old timers, you know, Joe Lewis didn't dance, right? He was a flat footed fighter, right? And here's the way Joe Lewis was fighting. Joe Lewis was fighting like this. But he was quick. Oh, here, see? He shuffled around the ring. Like the mummy. You ever see the mummy? <laughs> <laughs> well, how is the mummy going to catch me? And I'm just jumping and dancing and all shuffling and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. No, I'm tall and Joe Lewis and... See, when you say the greatest of all times, you're saying something. See, just think the boxing ability. Joe Lewis drew nothing but the cigar smoking fight fans. When I fight, everybody, every country, the Catholics, the Christians, the black militants, the rednecks, the <laughs> Israelis, the Muslims, the Jews, the whole world. See, my fights are so now in Saudi Arabia, Bangkok, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, Pakistan, Algeria, Turkey, Lebanon, the Sudan, and they've never watched American sports. We've just been invited to Red China and Peking, member managers, with the sack of America since Nixon, actually invited by the head of the whole government. See, so I can't be ranked with no boxers. I mean, no boxer can come here and talk to you now or can lecture the college. Huh? What you say? Jack Sharkey was champ. Nobody had ever heard of him, did he? When was that? What year? What year was that? 
Where are you? You're the boxing expert. Not I'm... Where you was Jack Sparkle champ? Indonesia was here before America. But the uh, communications in those days. No, they had. No. Jack Sharky, he's he not even no way ranked with what we're talking about. We're not talking about race or nothing. We're talking about great boxers who, ability-wise, record, the fights, the greatness they did, the action, the movement, got the film. We, see, it ain't the race. It's just, it just happened that the black ones are the best in that field. And the greatest of them all... Well, I didn't mention Jack Sharky right. for race. Oh, body. right. I was just saying, you know, I don't know. We talking about... I figured you were sitting waiting that they haven't heard of him because they didn't have communication. Well, he wasn't nobody to be heard of no way. But the greatest of them, the greatest of them all, I would say the greatest fighter of all times, he just wasn't a heavyweight, was Sugar Ray Robinson. The prettiest scientific master boxer. No scratches on his face. He wouldn't even get his hair messed up. So that's what I'm talking about. All right, been able to the, the move, the left jab. The, the one-two punch, the ducking, the inside punch, and moving, the pivot, the footwork, the skill, the time, and the grace. Ballet dancer, hitting and moving, ducking. It's pretty to watch. Not just two bloody fighters hitting each other and trading. That's what I'm talking about. This is what I mean. I say the greatest of all times is Muhammad Ali. The fastest. No, the greatest of all heavyweight. But I'm faster than Sugar Ray. He was 157, and I'm 220, and I'm still faster. I'm telling you, I'm in a class of my own. I'm not ranked with him. Seriously, in the ring, with my footwork, when I'm training like I should, the cameras, they have a hard time following me. You see the cameras move. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, there's never been a heavyweight fighter. And my worst enemies will admit, the fastest, I'm so fast, I'd hit you before God gets the news. <laughs> it's too bad I'm not here to fight so y'all can see. It. But you watch the next fight with Ken Norton. Well, if you hadn't been stripped of your title, would you still but, be undefeated today? I'd like to say one more thing. Fellas, I'm not boasting. It's just hard to be humble when you're as great as I am. <laughs> it's hard to be humble. I'm not boasting. So y'all forgive me. Who do you fight second today in boxing, heavyweight boxing? Fighting today? The best boxer next to myself, heavyweight, is James Ellis. But he's not good enough to beat George Foreman because he's too light and he don't take a good punch and he tires too quick. But George Foreman all around. Have you seen Nick Wells box? What do you think of him? Yeah. Nick Wells. Nick Wells in the, uh, the army. He box oranges, cigars. Yeah. <laughs> the Russian American man. I no, I never heard of him. How about Dwayne Bavik? Dwayne Bavik, yeah, he's my great white hope. <laughs> 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 I like him. I, I was in uh, 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 Bo Kentucky. What did he fight that night? First pro fight, Lexington. In my hometown, out of Louisville, I went with him to win his uh, first pro fight. I'm rooting him on. He's worth $5 million gate one day. About two, three more years, they can keep building him up. I'll be an old man then. The old man meets the white hope. Will the lip be shut tonight? Big publicity. When did you receive the cut over your left eye? Bobby Foster. I don't know about my third, uh, about seven months ago. No, I have, I have two cuts from amateurs with them eyebrows, Carolyn Sam. I'm going to talk to some plastic surgeons when I retire and see if I can get them cuts moved. <laughs> can they do that now? Are they that good now? I like to get those so I'll stay pretty. It doesn't go back here. I imagine it wouldn't from there. <laughs> What's your opinion of that computer fight that had you lose? That computer fight? When I lost to Marsano? That was an Alabama computer. <laughs> <laughs> Governor Wallace and Mr. Maddox ran that computer. I know who ran that computer. Angela Davis and Hewitt Newton ran that computer. I would have won. <laughs> no, that's a that's computer fight, just one man's opinion. I imagine if I'd fought Sonny Liston, if they ran the computer fight with Sonny Liston before I fought him, 
the rest of the world. So it's hard. It's just a um, publicity. I'm just mad because they didn't pay me the money I should have got out of it. That's all. Is there, any, is there any possibility of you ever losing a fight again? Yeah, I'll lose a fight if I'm not right and don't train like I should. But if you think about it, I'm really undefeated. If you think about the conditions that I supposed to have lost in. Four years, the most heavyweight was out, I think, Joe Lewis at two and a half years, and there was a miracle when he came back. I was out four years, a two-week notice, and I know I whipped Joe Frazier. He's finished, and I'm still going strong. I've had 13 fights since Frazier. He's had three, and he just can't, he can't, he can't walk straight in the ring now. He's been hit on the head so much. I know that I've run him. Now, so I don't look at that fight as getting beat up. He took the worst physical beating, uh, the computers. They, I hit him 688 times, hit me 330 something. Now, Ken Norton, we know what happened there. The fight was even to 11th round with a completely broken jaw. I've never yet been, I mean, beat to the punch and out maneuvered when I'm in shape. I mean, beat. But I'm going to go, I told you, another year and a half and I'm getting out because time will catch me. Would you have ever lost the fight if you hadn't lost the title? I don't think so. But I can prove all of this by quit talking, get in shape, come back and whip Norton, wipe out George Foreman, and retire Joe Frazier for good, and then hang him up and give it to some other young fella. You don't have any contract problems getting Frazier and Foreman to fight you? No. They'll have to fight me in order to earn a living. <laughs> Seriously. I lost to Frazier, right, they say. I lost to Norton, right? It don't bother me. I'm still active. Just did this Howard Cosell thing. Just did Mike Douglas. Just did uh, Dick Cavett. Going to do Johnny Cost next week. Uh, all the magazines, all the colleges. Because they don't have the personality of the charisma. They just box. How you feel, Foreman? Or how you feel, Norton? I don't preach you. Okay. <laughs> See, it's hard to make, like, as long as I have breath in me and as long as I can put on a good show, I'll be number one draw. I'm Are fighting, to, uh, I'm fighting Norton. He just beat me and I'm doubling everything, salvaging, building everything. And he just beat me. But, Are you close to a contract with Norton? Norton, we just signed. I'm, meet, signed? I'm meeting Norton September the 10th in the Los Angeles Farm. Almost sold out, four months in advance. But you watch what I do to him the next time, brother. Any predictions on the right? Prediction? No prediction. You giving that up? No, if I give you a prediction, you might not come to fights. I can't give you the prediction. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions, fellas? I gotta do some shaving. What are you feeling about how it goes? Next question. <laughs> when you get out of fighting, you you'll still be the champ. You think you're the greatest. What's my feeling about TV? how it goes? Oh, you will go to that one. No. You know. After looking at Howard Cosell, I'm glad all black people look alike. <laughs> you know, black people, black, <laughs> black people like Howard Cosell. You know why? They enjoy seeing a white guy make a fool out of himself on television. <laughs> That's Red Fox's joke. He used it the other night. We just had a roast for Howard Cosell. Y'all feel the same way? Y'all don't like me? <laughs> Probably go into television or some type of uh, entertainment when you get out of fighting. No, no, I don't think so. No. There is a Muslim sect I know, but I think I'm sorry, I'm not taking word on Muslims. That distrust of all whites. Do you feel most whites? Uh, would you trust? Are you trustful of whites? Well, it's, I, I, I look at it. I trust, and I have individuals on the basis of what I know about them. See, I know a lot of blacks I can't trust. And I imagine in every race, you got good and bad and people you can trust and can't trust. And it's I have to know them a while. I can't say who I trust or don't trust. The only people I worry about are the ones closer to me. I don't worry about other people. See? And that's the trouble I have is out of the ones that are around me that are my brothers. So I don't have time to worry about who I can trust of any other races when I'm having trouble with mine. You understand? <laughs> What's your relationship with my man Brown? He's with me. He's a assistant trainer of Angelo Dundee. He comes only a few weeks before the fight to get his pay and I get him out of my face. 
all the problems before all patched up now you're all back yeah we he, yeah he took his punishment you heard about when i fired him was he with you in the north fight yeah he was yeah I don't know. I just want to use my time and travel in the country. We have a lot of problems in the black areas that only blacks can solve and teachers of uh, black can solve. And uh, these are the problems that I dwell on. Problems like respect of self, help self, get out and work and quit begging looking for welfare and man around just because the government's going to give you a crumb, pool your resources, education, and classification for self-independence, respect of the woman, which is something that's not done, and a little more love for self and quit fighting and cutting and shooting every Friday and Saturday night each other and drinking. We got prostitution problems, we got dope problems, and we got all kind of problems that only one among us can solve. Who is the man I represent is Elijah Muhammad, who I want to help spread his works and cleaning up and making our people better citizens of the world, not just America. And to get out and work and do for self. Quit being violent and, and all these physical revolutions and start getting a mental revolution going where we can do for self and help self and, and get out and go in business and and be independent. So this is a good teaching for a nation that don't do it. And we got people all over the country, all kind of sinners. And my life will be so short until what I can do will only be a grain of sand in the desert to what needs to be done. And life is so short until if I live to be probably a uh, hundred, some more still can be done. So all I want to do is do all I can to help my people. Now that I've made it, I've made probably eight, nine million dollars since I've been fighting. I got a couple of Rolls Royces, $250,000 home, and homes in different parts of the country. They paid me as high as $3,000 just to come in tonight to talk. Paid me 5000 last night to talk at the Howard Cosell thing. And I got it made, but my people are still catching hell. They're still hungry. They're still in poverty. They still can't pay rent. They still can't, can't buy food. They're still raggedy, out of doors. So I'm going to do all I can now in helping to uplift the people. So uh, this is the best thing I can do with my few days and my fame and my influence. I could make a movie, make a nude movie, probably make $10 million. That won't be helping. <laughs> or I could probably go out in uh, Hollywood and promote some type of endorsement of alcohol or something that's not too good. I turn these down every day. And uh, so that's all I want to do. I come out of Louisville, Kentucky. I'm lucky I had a talent to get out of the rut, the ghetto. So now that I'm here, got a lot of knowledge I've gained and finance and influence, I want to use it to help those who might listen. So I think ministering and preaching, but not the Christian kind of talk that you get in churches on Sunday, real cold truth that the preacher don't talk about it. So this is the best thing. I mean, just the attitude in here now when I talk on these subjects, you look more serious and more concerned and it's getting to more people. So this is the best thing for me to do, is to do all I can to help the other ones. Because somebody helped me, you know. So that's all I'm gonna do. Do you think you'll be as effective when you're through with boxing as you are now with training through? Oh, more so. This, this word has got me effective how I'm in boxing. As to what I represent, and my stand on draft, and my religious beliefs, my change of name, and my whole image period has made me bigger than boxing. No, man, boxing ain't nothing. I could stay here and talk to you for hours on many subjects and make you feel shame. That's a square question. When they talk to me, they ask me questions that they would ask some senator or some governor or the president. They don't look at me as a boxer. I just turned down a job at Oxford University, the biggest seat of learning in the world. They want me to be a professor of poetry and social studies. That's right. In African history. Oxford University. You may have read about the other day. And I turned it down. It's no joke. The serious teachers of Oxford, they voted me. So I have a lot to say if they stop listening, but I don't.